Hello and welcome. I'm Andrew, aka the original Big Biscuit, and today we're going to be continuing our XR Toolkit programming series by taking a closer look at interactors. We are going to be kind of extending our last video where we focused on interactables, where they sort of share the same events, but interactors are very complex and were offered a lot by XR Toolkit. One of the things that's pretty interesting is that XR Toolkit does already supply a ton of interactors that do a lot of stuff for us. So I don't know how useful this is going to be, but depending upon how detailed you get in the development of your project, I think creating your own interactors is something that's eventually going to come up. In this video, we're going to be focusing on creating our own sockets because those tend to be things that are a little bit easier to program for. And I think I can put together some things that may actually be useful for you. We'll be starting off with a simple tag check for uh, having interactables being selected by our socket, but we're also going to be pre-programming a socket that can automatically select interactables that they are near. So I think that sounds good. I think that's a good enough intro. Let's get started and see what's going on on the screen. And our scene is very similar to as it was before. We have our drill, but I also have a couple of spheres here that I have for our sockets where we just have a little sphere mesh so we can actually see it in the scene easier and a box collider that's been set to a trigger. And we're going to have uh, two of these, <laughs> if Union is going to let me select the other socket. We have two of these because one's going to be our tag socket, and another one is going to be our automatic selecting socket. We'll also be looking at another quick example for a gaze interactor that I wrote a couple years ago, just so we can get a deeper look into how interactors actually work. And I think that's a good enough place to start, so I'm going to open up this gaze interactor script. And you'll see that we have a number of things. We have this class called gaze interactor that inherits from the XR base interactor. And you'll see that we're primarily overriding this function called get valid targets, where it's supplying a list of IXR interactables that's just called valid targets. And this IXR interactable is just going to be an interface that uh, all the other interfaces that XR Toolkit uses inherits from, um, like the IXR select interactable or the hover or activate. But what this essentially does is that this is called by the interaction manager and passes us this list. And then we can fill it with whatever interactables that this interactor could potentially work with. I'm trying not to say interact too much, but usually what well, the first thing we want to do is clear that list and then have some additional functionality for how we want to add interactables to the list. For our sockets, as an example, you're going to see that it primarily uses on trigger enter and on trigger exit to manage what interactables that it can actually work with. But for our gaze interactor, uh, what I'm doing here is that I'm creating a raycast that's being called here. And then if we hit an actual object, we want to check to see if it has some sort of actual interactable that we can work with. And that's done right here in the check for interactable function where we can call the interaction manager since we have an easy reference to it since we're inheriting from the XR base interactor. And we have this nifty function on it that we can say try get interactable for collider. And if you're not super familiar with how XR toolkit sort of manages colliders, this can be a bit confusing. But XR toolkit actually does this pretty nifty thing for us where if there are any colliders attached to a particular interactable, it will automatically get all of those colliders and sort of map it to that interactable. So that's how we're able to have like multiple colliders for a single interactable that can trigger hover events and things like that. Because on the back end, XR Toolkit has already created this intricate mapping of how all these things are related to one another. But what you'll also realize is that I'm overriding this function called can select, and I'm passing the or returning the value of false. And I did this because for this gaze interactor for the project it was for, all it really did was try to figure out what interactables that the player was looking at, and then it added it to a sort of list somewhere so we can use that for, so then we could use that for data capture. So while this is happening, I don't really want it to accidentally select something for whatever reason. I probably didn't need this, but I just wanted to be sure. But what this ultimately let me do was still able to trigger those hover events. So any any interactable that this gaze interactor hovered, we I would just add that to a list somewhere, like I said. And this all may seem like a lot. We're going to be writing some of this stuff out when we work on our sockets. This is just kind of getting you a bit of a crash course, I guess we should say. So let's go back into Unity so we can create some scripts. But before we do that, if I come into the hierarchy here and we go to XR and we go to socket interactor, you'll see that it has these interactor filters. And these are sort of ways that we can value different interactables in their relation to this interactor based on things like tag or distance and pretty much anything that we could we would want because we could write our own filters for this. 
So in other words, the tag socket that we're going to be writing is just sort of the old way of doing it. If you want to go through this process of using the interactor filters, you can, but this is just a good example to kind of get our feet wet and in writing interactors. Okay, so let's go up to our scripts. We'll right click and I'm going to create a couple of them here. I think we'll just call this, we'll call one tag socket and then we'll call the other one auto socket. And of course it opened up my Visual Studio for me, so let's close that. And then we'll create another one that we'll just call auto socket. And we'll open up both of these in Visual Studio. And like all our scripts, the first thing we're gonna do is add the XR Toolkit namespace. And then we're going to inherit from the XR socket interactor. And we do not need these two functions here. And what we're ultimately going to do here is we're going to have a list of strings and within can hover and can select, we're going to check to see if the interactable we're getting has the string or has the tag that we want for this interaction to actually occur. We'll also do a little extra thing for when we select entered and exit, we'll toggle the mesh for this socket just so I can show that you can override functions like you can in interactables. So the first thing that we will create is a private list of strings, not stings, that we will call tags. And we'll initialize that to a new list. And then we're going to get a reference to our mesh renderer. Cool. But what's also nice about this is that I'll actually show that when we're going to be using some of the messages that are built into Unity, like awake and start, sometimes those are already being called by classes that we're inheriting from. So we need to make sure that we write protected override. There we go. And it's going to call the base functionality. If it does not call the base functionality, suddenly your interactables are going to start doing some weird things. But all we're going to be doing here is getting our mesh renderer. And then we'll go ahead and we'll write out the rest of the signatures for our functions. So we're going to want to override the on select entered, on select exited. We're going to create a additional function that we'll just call toggle mesh that will pass in a boolean value. And then we're going to override two additional functions, the can hover and can select. So we can control whether this interactable can select or can hover a particular interactable. So we have can hover. We also want to make sure that we're going to be using these, the ones with the interfaces. So the IXR hover interactable rather than it's saying, um, I believe it would just be the XR base interactable, which I can just show you that we do can select. And if I do the wrong one, it'd be the XR base interactable, and it'll give me a little warning here that's like, hey, don't use this. So, so there we go. And then we'll have a little function that just says um, to check for has a relevant tag. And we'll pass in our XR in interactable because it doesn't really, we don't need to be specific about it. And we'll just return true for now. Cool. So like I said, what we're going to be doing once this socket has selected an interactable, we're going to just disable the mesh just so you can kind of see uh, that it's doing something. So we'll just call our function toggle mesh and we'll pass in false. And then we want to do the opposite. So once we lose the interactable, we'll turn it back to true. Cool. And then within toggle mesh, we'll just have our mesh renderer enabled and we'll set our value there. See, easy enough. Now let's move down here. Maybe not that far. There we go. And now within can hover and can select. And what I usually like to do for these is have the functionality that I'm checking for in different functions, because this can get pretty complex. So I try and just actually give things names. So instead of it being like our tag list dot contains whatever we're getting, I like to just write that in um, has relevant tag, because also if you're going to be reusing these functionality between can hover and can select, it's nice just to have it in one place. And you'll see what I mean in a second. If we write uh, and, we'll say has relevant tag, and we'll pass in our interactable, and then we'll copy that and we'll add it to can select as well. And you'll notice that within can hover, we're getting a hover interactable, and within can select, we're getting a select interactable. And for us to be able to use this has relevant tag, it has the more generic version that's just XR interactable. 
kind of like I mentioned earlier. But all we need to do now is go tags dot contains interactable dot transform dot tag. And you'll remember, and I think I covered this in the first video, how this interactable sort of has some references that we can work with, and that includes a transform of the game object that it's attached to, which it's just good to know that. So let's exit out of this. And believe it or not, this socket is actually done. So now anytime that an interactable comes in contact with the socket, it's going to do this tag check. So this is really basic, but now let's actually look at a socket that may be a little bit more useful to you, one that can automatically grab something in your hand once you get it close to it. So much like before, we'll add a the namespace that we're gonna need. And we'll also inherit from the XR socket interactor. One thing we could do is take a closer look at it to see if there's anything that may be worth talking about. It may be worth um, opening up the actual script to show you what the can hover and can select looks like since there's just a lot of stuff going on. So we may do that after we write out this script. So now all we need to do is remove this. Actually, it may be worth looking at it now. So give me just a second. Okay, cool. So as you can imagine, interactors are pretty complex, which I usually wouldn't advise writing one from scratch. So it's usually good to try and inherit from the Ray interactor or direct. But if we scroll down here, you'll see that we have these can select and can hover functions where there's already some functionality here. And all this is really saying is, well, first and foremost, there's the base functionality here of the base interactor, and this returns true. So this doesn't really do anything for us. But this first line here, it's, it's basically saying, if this socket doesn't have a selection and the interactable it's trying to select is not selected, it can select it or it's already selecting that particular interactable and that interactable has no other interactors currently selecting it. So this basically prevents the socket from accidentally grabbing an interactable that you may be holding. But there may be situations where we would actually want this. And this is where it's good to actually know how to write our own custom functionality for this stuff. And some of that functionality also occurs here in can hover, where there's this actual Boolean here that says, is hover recycle allowed? And this is just basically a timer so that if you pull a interactable from a socket, it's going to wait about a second before it tries to reselect it again. And that's pretty much what we're going to be doing for our customized socket. It may be easier if we could access some of these variables, and there's a few hacky ways of being able to actually use them, but I think it's a little uh, out of the scope for this video. So let's go back into our auto socket now, so we can actually kind of use some of what we've learned. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a private float, that I'm just going to call remove time. And then we'll write all of our functions out. Override on select exiting. On select exiting. What was that? <laughs> and then we'll write some functions and then I'll, oh, well, let's write about it. I'll explain them. Um, so we'll have our store time. I'm, like I said, we'll explain that in a second, but we'll write a public override for can select. We're going to have another function that's going to be private. Then I'm just going to call can quick select. That's going to accept a same variable as this one. So we'll just copy that and we'll turn true for now. And then we'll have another private bool that just says has select time. And we'll just return true for now as well. So what we're ultimately going to be doing here is as the socket begins to select an interactable, it's going to store the time at which it selected it. And then within can select, we're going to check that time along with some other selection functionality. So within on select exiting, we'll call our function called store time. And we'll say remove time equals time dot time. This is just a really more straightforward way of having a timer without actually having a timer. <laughs> now what was useful about me showing you what was actually going on within the XR socket interactor is that we actually don't want to be calling the base functionality. We're going to be overriding it completely because if you remember, it has functionality that's going to prevent the socket from selecting an interactable if it's already selected. So we'll actually delete this and we'll call the function below this called can quick select and pass in the interactable. 
And then we'll also just check to see if we have the correct select time. So if we grab the interactable from the socket, it, the socket doesn't immediately grab it from your hand. It's going to give us a second to move it away from the socket and then it can grab it once again. So we'll complete that and we'll go down on down to quick select where this is going to look pretty similar to how it looked within the socket interactor. So we'll first say we want to make sure that the socket doesn't have a selection. So we'll say has selection or is currently selecting the interactable that it may already be selecting. So we're basically saying here, hey, if we don't have a selection or if we're already selecting the interactable, just continue to do what you're doing because the can select function actually not only occurs to validate the initial selection, but it is constantly checked while it is being selected by the interaction manager. So within the has select time, we want to say if our remove time equals zero, which this is just a little extra thing we have to put in here if we want to select the interactable as soon as our game starts. So don't worry about that too much. The actual logic is coming after this. So we'll say time dot time. So the current time of our, so is this the current time or the time of the scene? The time at the beginning of this frame. Okay. So the current time of this frame, if it's greater than our remove time, plus the recycle delay time. And I didn't actually explain this. So this is going to be factored into that hover that we just looked at. So if we go in here, we'll see that it has this recycle delay time. And this is just an additional value to prevent the socket to automatically begin to hover something that you're trying to remove from it. And we're just reusing this value rather than creating our own. If this was a public Boolean and maybe it was just called is recycled allowed, we could easily just reuse this. But like I said, sometimes you kind of get creative or have to write your own functionality. But that's the goodness of XR Toolkit that I feel. Let's go back into our auto socket. And believe it or not, that's actually it. So just to sort of go over what we've done, we have a little variable to store once the interactable has been removed from the socket. And we're going to store it here. So we can check to see how much time has elapsed before we can select it again. And then we're going to factor that into this functionality within Quick Select to let us be able to select interactables that may be selected by the player. And then finally, we just do a little bit of timing math here. Okay, so let's remove this. And I think this looks good as well. Actually, no, he was hiding. I found you. All right, now let's go back into Unity. Okay, cool. So let's go to our tag socket. And we'll drag this guy on. And I don't know if there's anything we need to do. I usually don't like the hover meshes, so I'll delete or disable those for now. And we'll go to our auto sockets. Now we don't have to change anything on the auto socket, but we will at least apply those changes that we just made. For the socket though, I need to see what tags we had. I think I was just using player because it was built in, but let's just make our own really quick. I'll just call this drill. Cool. And we'll say, hey, we want to check for the drill tag before we actually select anything here. And then we want to make sure that our drill is actually marked as a drill. Cool. So let's actually see if this works. Well, actually, let's do this. Let's have it untagged. And for our tag socket, we'll set the drill as the starting selected interactable. So as soon as our project starts, the socket is going to try and grab the drill. So let's hit play. All right. So if we click over to the scene, you'll see that nothing has happened. <laughs> which is expected. But I think I don't know if there's anything we could do to make it select without anything too crazy. So let's now just apply our drill tag and let's hit play again. I'm gonna laugh if this doesn't work. <laughs> okay. And there we go. It's actually selected it. And you'll also notice that the mesh is gone. So that's working as well. So now let's just get in our headset and we'll see if this auto select works. So let give me one second. Right, so I think we're all good to go. Let's hit play again. All right, now that we got all that set up, you'll see that our drill has uh, been selected by our other socket, so we'll grab that. And that's all good. Uh, I'm going to switch to the camera right now so you can see what I look like when I have to record sections like this. Hello? <laughs> all right, so now if we lower it down, I'm, I promise I'm holding on to the, the grip. I'm not doing this if I move it down. And once it selects, it automatically grabs it from my hand. But you'll notice 
once I grab the drill again, it's going to wait a second before it actually grabs it. So I actually have a chance to pull it away. And this is the easiest version of doing this rather than trying to do some weird trigger select exit shenanigans. But there you go. So hopefully you found that useful. I know this video is probably a little chaotic, but I think that's kind of what this series is. Just a little bit of programming, a little bit of chaos, and we get to spend some time together. It's Thursday, so I'm, I'm slowly losing my mind. But anyway, that's the end of the video. I'm going to put patrons up here somewhere because they're all wonderful people. If you'd like to be a patron, I'm sure you already know where to look for that information. But that's it for me. If you'd like to see what's in the next video, feel free to let me know, and I'll see you around.